Thanks so much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're all extremely welcome to the first of our climate conversations uh, hosted by the Climate Gathering in association with the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, IBEC, TROCRA, Christian Aid, and the Environmental Pillar. Um, we have a lot to get through this evening. We're quite a packed program, so. Uh, forgive me if I just do very uh, quick introductory remarks. My name is Ryan Mead. Uh, I've been involved in the Climate Gathering since it started back in 2012, and our first two events in 2013, uh, the first uh, in Ballyvaughan, County Clare, and the second in Dublin in, in June of 2013. Uh, this is a really exciting venture for us, and it's a very exciting coalition of organizations who've come together to uh, stage these conversations. Um, as I say, we have a lot to get through. It's quite an interesting program. Um, 
The first half of the evening, more or less, will be, I suppose, focused on listening. We have a number of different presentations and a, a couple of speeches, uh, which I hope you'll find interesting and stimulating. And then in the second half of the evening, between eight and nine, uh, we'll have a panel discussion and some good opportunity for uh, audience members to get involved, ask questions, and to um, uh, join the conversation. Um, before I introduce our first speaker, I just want to uh, say a quick thank you, obviously, to those five organizations I mentioned who have come together to, to, to host these uh, conversations. We're having five conversations between now and May, and I'll talk a little bit about the rest of the program at the end of the night. Um, but I, I just want to particularly mention a few other people who aren't necessarily associated with those organizations, but who have kept this idea of producing this collaboration alive over the last year or so. Um, Martin Hawkes, um, Vili Kiefel from FASTA, Paul Harris, um, Pater Kirby, and I'm probably forgetting some, but um, these are some people who just gave their time voluntarily to try to make uh, these events happen, and uh, it's been really exciting to see it come together and to see the, the uh, partners come on board. So, as I say, for the first half of the evening, uh, sit back and listen to the presentations, see what you think, and then we'll have a conversation in the second half. But for our first speaker, I'd just like to uh, particularly welcome uh, David Begg, uh, who's uh, recently uh, finished up being head of ICTU. Um, because we don't have time, I don't have time to tell you that he's the erudite and charming David Begg, which he asked me to do, but uh, uh, <laughs> I, uh, he agreed that I didn't have to say that just to save time. But uh, in particular, we're, we just want to express our thanks to the Irish Congress Trade Unions for really getting on board with this initiative, facilitating the use of this uh, uh, great hall here this evening. And I'd just like to ask you to welcome uh, David Begg. Thank you. bad start to fall up the stairs. Most people fall down. Um, Ryan, thank you very much for your introduction. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me to be with you this evening. We're very pleased to be associated with this particular uh, venture and very pleased that it started off here in Liberty Hall, which is kind of the iconic uh, building for the trade union movement in Ireland. Not, not its natural headquarters, but I think in the, in the popular mind always regarded as such as the building from which the uh, proclamation in 1916 was printed uh, and from where the citizen army went off to the GPO. So it has a, a place in our history and you're very welcome here. Well, just to say that uh, the, the theme for what I, for the remarks that I want to make, I've uh, taken as uh, the title that there are no jobs on a dead planet and something that I've borrowed from the International Trade Union Confederation because this is the campaigning slogan that it has adopted in its preparations for the the Paris uh, Climate Change Summit uh, starting at the end of November uh, next. And it's intended to emphasize that the future of work is actually acutely dependent on environmental sustainability. It is, in effect, a core issue for workers and for trade unions. However, in the reflection I want to share with you this evening, I want to draw not just on my experience as a representative of the labor movement as such, but also on perspectives I gained working in the field of international development over a number of years. But mostly though, I, I actually want to speak to you out of concern for my own grandchildren and the condition of the planet that we will bequeath to them and to their uh, generation. So when people speak of the need for a green industrial revolution, what do they really mean? Now, according to Mariana Mazzucato, who writes quite interestingly on the whole question of uh, industrial structures and industrial policy, the basic premise is that the current global industrial system must be radically transformed into one that is environmentally sustainable. Sustainability will require an energy transmission transition that places non-polluting clean energy technologies at the fore. It moves us from the dependence on finite fossil and nuclear fuels and favors infinite sources of fuel, the renewable fuels that originate basically from the sun. Now, building a sustainable industrial system also requires better agricultural practices, stronger energy efficiency measures, higher quality water infrastructure, technologies for recyclable materials, and advanced waste management. 
And in respect of the latter, I, I just want to share something I feel very strongly about myself. And that is that, you know, any time I go out to cycle around, as I do quite often, the byways of North County Dublin, I'm really appalled by the extent to which the ditches and the culverts and the gateways of fields clogged up with illegally dumped waste. And it's it really would make you despair at times and raises a serious question about how people feel about these things that they go on in this particular way. But in any event, I think the whole idea of a green industrial revolution has to transform existing economic sectors and create new ones. That's the basic premise. And it's a direction that continues without a clear stopping point, but with a kind of a growing public benefit, actually in the form of having uh, a planet that will not be destroyed. And closely tied to the concept of a green revolution is the problem of climate change. Climate change is a global environmental crisis that actually impacts all of us, and which is the direct result of current centers of major economic activity. Climate change is driven by the emission of greenhouse gases, and the majority of these gases are byproducts of the dominant energy production systems, whether it's uh, by coal, increasingly natural gas, by oil, or whatever, but those systems that drive modern economies. And it's important to realize, I think, that we simply don't have a choice but to act, and to act decisively in this matter. I think it has reached that stage. And we know that the science is unequivocal. Without urgent and ambitious action, we will face temperature rises of four degrees centigrade or more this century, and irreversible changes in our climate. Climate catastrophes and extreme weather cyclones, tsunamis, floods, droughts, fires, melting glaciers, seasonal changes, threats to agriculture and much more are increasing. And indeed, we've seen evidence of this actually in the past few days in terms of the destructive events which have hit the Pacific Islands. And even in Ireland, like last winter, uh, unprecedented damage was done to many locations from coastal storms and coastal erosion is now becoming some serious problem uh, for us. But this pales into insignificance in comparison to the risks to sub-Saharan Africa. By 2080, between 65 and 100% of land which is currently used for coffee production uh, will become unsustainable for that purpose. And by 2050, 3% of Africa's land will no longer be able to, graze, to grow maize. In Uganda alone, for instance, the importance of this can be judged by the fact that coffee exports represent 30% of foreign currency earnings. And if you take a, a country like Malawi, which is a country I've been in many, many times. The impact of climate change are manifested in various ways. Increased uh, and more intense rainfall, uh, changing patterns of rainfall, floods, droughts, and prolonged dry spells. And the latest episode there led to more than 100,000 people uh, being displaced, which is confirming that, that very sad trend. Now, it is still possible to avoid surpassing that 2% threshold that most scientists seem to agree on, which is critical to the future sustainability. Possible for a few years, but after that the window will close and the opportunity to maintain global warming on any kind of manageable scale uh, will be gone. And the solutions are known. They include massive investment in renewables and clean technologies, getting the best we can out of efficient uh, energy use, transforming agriculture and protecting forests. Now it sounds simple, but of course it really isn't. I mean, effecting a transition to a new type of economy involves very difficult trade-off and choices. And take, for example, uh, the position of a country like Poland. That country has 100,000 people working in the coal mines, and it's an unsustainable industry. But I doubt if anybody here, you know, would suggest that the Polish government should adopt the same type of approach as Maggie Thatcher did, say, with the mines in, in Britain. And finding, the point is that finding the means to adjust transition to a new type of economy, as called for by the international trade union movement, is, I think, a moral, economic, and a political imperative. Now, can a just transition actually be accomplished, though? Well, I think the way to look at this question is from the perspective of creating institutions that manage change. You know, after all, industrial restructuring is not a new phenomenon. It's more than 60 years since the Austrian economist Joseph Schumpeter coined the phrase creative destruction to describe how capitalism as a system evolves. 
technological developments will in any event bring their own challenges. You know, consider the possibility, which is current, say, of the driverless car. That seems now like a real prospect. It'd be hugely disruptive. Immediately, you can see that would bring an end, for instance, to occupations like bus drivers and taxi drivers and even uh, traffic police and people like that. But it would doubtless also save lives and reduce insurance costs and transform energy efficiency. So viewed in the broader context, the challenge of transitioning to a low carbon economy is in principle not hugely different to managing technological change uh, generally, and particularly those disruptive forms that I have just described. So managing a just transition uh, as advanced by the uh, ITUC requires us first, I think, to build into our economic system institutions with the capacity to kind of handle that type of change. Now, Industrial destruction and its social consequences is a huge issue. No one can deny that. But it can be managed, I think, with the right will and right approach. And simply put, I think it means that markets must be embedded in society and not the other way around, as they currently seem to be. And this is the core thesis of the great Hungarian-born political economist Karl Polanyi, who wrote an impressive critique of liberalism in 1944, which he called the Great Transformation, and which still influences progressive thinkers uh, of today, like Mariana Mazzucato, whom I mentioned earlier. Frankly, though, I am worried about the current state of democratic capitalism in the world. Now, a discussion on this topic needs much more time than we have available tonight, but suffice it to say that there used to be a widely shared consensus, certainly between the end of World War II and the 1980s, that for capitalism to be compatible with democracy, it had to be subjected to extensive political control so as to protect democracy from having to be restrained in the name of free markets. And as the years since 2008 have revealed, since the financial crisis hit us then, markets are increasingly dictating the terms under which governments may govern. In other words, political economy has been subordinated to a particular form of market-driven economics. As the French economist Thomas Piketty uh, and others have suggested, uh, this is leading to an unsustainable level of inequality in society, another type of, of uh, unsustainability. And the paradox here is that markets will not drive the transformation to a low carbon economy because they have no concern fundamentally with public goods. It's a project which has to be state led. But in the new dispensation we are facing since 2008, the difficult question is whether governments will be allowed the policy space by the markets to do what they need to do. And on empirical evidence, one has to be a little bit pessimistic on that point. But in the end, like so many other things, this boils down to a conflict of ideas, a conflict between the idea of maximizing shareholder value at all costs and the idea of certain public goods. And ironically, for everybody's sake, the public interest has to prevail on this occasion. You know, perhaps the secret lies in a less orthodox way of looking at economics and the public interest. A few days before he was assassinated, almost 50 years ago, actually, Bobby Kennedy made a remarkable speech on the economy and society in the University of Kansas. And he was speaking at that time about what he had encountered as poverty in the United States. But the theme is consistent. What he was addressing was, how do we judge well-being? You know, we tend to judge it by the growth in the economy. But he was trying to say, this is not all. This is not the most important thing. It is not the be all and end all of everything. And these were the words he spoke, and I think they're very eloquent and still relevant. He said, the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. And I spoke earlier about my concern for the kind of world we are bequeathing to our children and our grandchildren. The debate of climate change we are now trying to initiate here tonight, I think, is very important in that context. 
Because over the years, Kennedy's words do resonate somewhat, I would say, with the challenge that we're trying to get to grips with. But I would like to end, if I can, on a kind of an optimistic note. You know, in 1930, when John Maynard Keynes wrote that famous essay of his entitled Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, he wildly predicted, as it seems at the time, that in 100 years, living standards would be four to eight times higher than they were at the time. And everybody thought he was crazy and mad. But actually, he was vindicated. That's the way it turned out. And this is really about ideas and the choices that flow from them. And our idea, I think, friends, really is this, in its most simple terms, that there is a better, fairer way to organize the economy and society. The key is to try to minimize the losses and to maximize the possibilities. And ideas do catch on in time. You know, the fastest selling luxury car in the United States, for example, at the moment, is the battery-powered Telsa car that is transforming consumers' notion about what a car should be. And today also we read in our newspapers that the International Energy Agency is reporting that 2014 was the first time in 40 years in which there was a halt or a reduction in the emissions of greenhouse gases that was not tied to an economic downturn. Now this is not a, a, an excuse for complacency, you understand, but perhaps a reason for hope all the same. And Keynes himself famously said on one occasion, it's ideas that are dangerous for good or ill. And hopefully tonight we will begin to start the process of getting people to think about different ideas. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, David, for getting us started. Uh, David mentioned the Kennedys in his uh, introduction there. And our next speaker is a Kennedy, uh, Father Kennedy O'Brien. Um, I don't know if you're any relation, but uh, I'd like to uh, call on uh, Father Kennedy O'Brien uh, from Gonzaga and the Jesuit Order to give us a short talk. Thank you. Good evening. I feel a bit like a fish out of water here. Um, I was asked by Eamon to give this talk and I just hope what I have to say is useful. He was talking about communicating about the problem of climate change and trying to see it from as many angles as possible. And it seems to me that there's a faith aspect to this, and that's what I wish to speak about. Religion or faith is not about laws and regulations. It's not about doctrines. It's not about what divides people, but what unites them. And Christianity has something very very special to offer. We have a vision of God that's triune. We used to traditionally say Father, Son, and Spirit. Perhaps we could say Creator, Redeemer, and Spirit. God the Creator is the initiator of the whole thing, the expanding universe, expanding at a faster and faster rate. A God that's so big we can't even begin to think about him, to comprehend him or her. A God that's so vast, we can hardly even speak about that God. The Jews, the Muslims, try not to picture that God in images. God is involved with us, however. God is involved in creation. God the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, is God's aspect in creation. God joining into creation, becoming part of our creation. Of course he's part, because the whole thing is to do with him. But we have a very special role to play. That's what Jesus Christ taught. We're invited to be co-creators with God of this magnificent planet. Co-creators, people who share. God will not get involved to solve the problems of climate change or anything else, no matter how much we pray, no matter how many sacrifices take place. He will get involved insofar as we, as people, are moved in our relationships with one another here, and in particular with those less fortunate than ourselves, when we're involved in that and begin to look at the needs of other people, God becomes involved through us. We are to be, literally, his body and blood, God's body and blood in the world. That's what we're called to be. We are divine beings, not economic units. And 
the only way we find satisfaction is when we become what we're supposed to be, God beings. The work of the Spirit is God in you and God in me. It's that that inspires us with the beauty of nature, with the beauty of people, that drives us to search to know all knowable, which is truth, and to love all lovable, which is the essence of Christianity. Christianity, correctly understood and lived, demands that we see the, important, uh, the importance of every single individual person, their dignity, and therefore that we see the importance of what we do in looking after this world. Because if we don't, the injustice that already exists will become multiplied generation after generation after we have lost control. And that's really all I have to say. Thank you very much for that. I think um, one thing I didn't say at the start is uh, one of the inspirations for this series is a, a process that happened in Germany where the trade unions and the churches came together to kickstart a dialogue on climate change. I think it's kind of interesting that we've had our first two contributions from the trade union movement and from the uh, 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 sort of faith background. Um, can I just introduce our next uh, presentation, which is from an artist, uh, Emily Robin Archer. And I don't want to say too much about it because she's going to tell you about her work. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'll just start this at the beginning. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm here to give you the artist, artist perspective. Um, I'm Emily, I'm an artist um, working with um, environmental issues, I suppose. Um, creating installations and projects that, um, sorry if you couldn't hear me there, um, that invite a curiosity about the environment. And um, one of my recent projects is an environmental art um, initiative that goes into schools and educates. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to say too much about it, And in fact, because I've got three um, young boys here to, I think on the video here, they're going to tell you a bit about that. soft so you wouldn't uh, break the roots and you'd have to take out all the muck and then you put the, the plant in uh, gently because they're really delicate. The wind farm works using a pump in the centre. The water drips down and then um, it waters the plants and there's like a timer over there and it goes off every two hours. So now we're going to plant this first one, okay? So really gently, I need you guys to, to just put the pebbles in around it, okay? So take one hand and hold it very gently so you've got lemon time. Do you want to smell it? Okay. It's nice, is it? Okay, that's our first plant to go in the window farm. Mission completed! was the basil plant. It smells delicious. I liked planting the ears. And now we have our own bit of nature in our school, which is just brilliant. I just, I love it. So um, what you saw there was, um, oh, <laughs> thanks. 
Um, so what, what you saw there was um, a hydroponic system that we built using all recycled materials and the boys in that school, in Adesh school, just up the road in Dublin 8, got a chance to touch plants and put their hands in, in, into plants and smell them. And really they have, they have no green area in their school, they're kind of surrounded by concrete and the urban existence, I suppose. Um, so it was really powerful as a learning tool for them to see, to connect them with local food systems, growing their own food, and to teach them about issues like water scarcity and, and local food systems. So um, I, suppose, um, I, I suppose with that video in mind, I was gonna ask the audience if they, if you all, any of you can remember, and just in your own heads, if you can remember a time when um, environmental issues or something like climate change became really real to you and it really meant something to you because I think in communicating climate change, that's what's so important is getting people to connect in with it and feel something. And that's what I'm trying to do every day um, with, with my artwork and with these school projects and this small company that I've set up, Create Sustainability, is going into schools and we're trying to, to uh, um, manifest that all the time. So just for the rest of the evening, if you can hold that idea in your head and I suppose, um, whatever time it was, who was there, what they did, or what, what made you feel, um, re made you feel that, um, uh, feel something about environmental issues and climate change, if you can keep that in your head. And I suppose for me, um, I've included a family photo because for me, um, climate change has made very real. Uh, I, I moved to Kenya with my family when I was a teenager, and it was all spectacular, and I, I got to see a lot of wildlife and everything, but. At the same time, I was really, really struck by um, the severe floods that were, or floods and droughts that were happening kind of all the time around where we were living. And um, well, to cut a long story short, this is the house that we used to live in in Africa. So, uh, you know, really, and I, all the time I was coming back to Ireland and at the time there really wasn't a lot of talk about climate change. So it was, it's an interesting perspective that I gained from that. Um, and I suppose I'll just flick through a few images um, of my other artwork and um, I'll just talk through them briefly. Um, so this is another uh, installation in a, in a gallery in Barcelona. It's a, a dragon made out of um, cardboard and uh, I have a detail here so you can see. Um, yeah, I use a lot of recycled materials but always with an emphasis to show people what can be done with, with limited resources but also to just grab their attention really about um, an environmental issue. This is a piece called Shoal. Um, it's a shoal of fish made out of tin cans. It was created to raise awareness of overfishing. And I now take this project into schools and we um, have created hundreds and hundreds of tin can fish to join the shoal and to raise awareness about the um, ocean pollution and overfishing. Um, I think I have another slide here, just a bit hanging in, in a gallery. It was created for the Dublin City of Science in 2010. Um, this is the, the original installation behind the um, window farm that you saw in the last video. Um, it was kind of a, a, a tower made out of sash windows and people could walk up to it and, and pump the water up and see it trickling down through the plants. And I suppose, again, it was to get people to think about where your food comes from and um, using this very um, up-to-date way of growing hydroponics and doing it in, in a very small space, so very practical for someone who lives in, an, in a very urban in, uh, apartment or something where they don't have space to grow, you can grow in your windows. And, and that's what led me to be doing these window farming projects and the picture on the right there is my latest uh, achievement it looks it doesn't look maybe as attractive but um we made it in, in Blackrock College just a, a week ago and um I'm really happy with it because it just uses very simple materials and the boys were able to create it themselves in a couple of hours and they had their own working hydroponic system by the end of the day and uh, they would be able to grow some of their own food that way so it's much cheaper and easier than the bigger ones um and this is a piece, a solar powered piece created for um, the ESB. I think I see it moving around now. Um, this was a commission from the ESB. Um, I suppose companies also want to communicate that they're on, on to making, having a green image, I guess. And just a sneak preview to uh, a drawing of an idea for a work that I have. Um, and I really want to focus on climate change this year with my work. And 
um, at this year at the solstice, I want to make a projection in this very special location and uh, create a kind of immersive environment and, and have information about climate change. So I'd love to hear any ideas from anyone and I'd love to hear from anyone afterwards. So um, I'm not, I don't have business cards with me, but please do get in touch or talk to me afterwards. And uh, thank you all for listening and it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Uh, that was terrific. Uh, I mentioned uh, at the start that this part of the program was about listening, and I think this next um, presentation is very much about listening. Uh, Karen Power is a composer, originally from Bantry, I understand, uh, who is going to um, give us an experience. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, hi there. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to, to be here. Um, so my name is uh, Karen Power, and I'm a composer, um, uh, educator, and improviser. Um, a little bit like my predecessor, I feel slightly out of, out of water um, in that my practice isn't uh, perhaps directly related um, to climate change issues. Um, however, it does um, and is firmly rooted in uh, the notion um, of listening to, being inspired by, um, and the strong belief in the power of hearing uh, our world. So that's really um, what I wanted to sort of bring up tonight. Um, I suppose the first thing to acknowledge is that um, sound is obviously everywhere. Um, it's in every action we do, it's with us all of the time. Whether or not we choose to listen to sound is another, um, is another issue. Um, however, on that back, there really is no such thing as a fully silent, natural environment. Uh, we can make a fully quiet environment but there's no such thing as a natural one. Um, once you acknowledge this, then the way you choose to listen to everything um, can alter. Once you acknowledge that there really is no way for you to fully close your ears to sound, um, then it begins to make you think about what you're listening to, why you're listening to it, uh, what you choose not to listen to, um, and what makes you sort of filter things out, filter out noise, for example. So let's take this room. Um, and please uh, do come with me on this one because I'm kind of going out on a limb here. Um, but what I'd like us all to do is, uh, when I count down from three, I'm gonna ask us to close our eyes. Um, and what I want you to do is to really focus on listening, just for like 30 seconds, okay? Um, but what I want you to do is to think about how you're listening, um, think about the sounds that you're hearing in the room, uh, think about your location in relation to those sounds. So where you are, where the sounds are to you, are they internal sounds, are you hearing your own breathing? Um, are they external, are you hearing the person next to you? Are you hearing the um, uh, heating system in the venue? Um, all of these things, um, I just, uh, so, on the count of three, and I'll do it too. Uh, three, two, one. Everybody close their eyes, please. Open your ears and just listen.
Okay, let's open our eyes. So um, I don't have time this evening um, for us to go through what it is you've listened to. If I was doing this with very young children, that would be the next stage. Um, but I can guarantee that not that every single person in this room uh, heard something slightly different. Um, one of the strengths about acknowledging uh, hearing and, and the way we listen is that obviously we all have uh, two ears and we all receive um, sound differently. Um, we all carry our own contexts to particular sounds uh, differently and in a unique way. And for me, that's one of the, the most interesting um, things uh, about working with sound. Um, so just moving on from that, um, from this room out into the world and out into environments. Um, so as a composer, I spend a lot of my time traveling the world um, and basically listening to environments. Um, I let those environments influence my work um, in a huge, huge variety of ways, um, far too great to get into any detail in um, here. Um, but what I have done is I've put together a few slides um, and uh, an extract from a piece. Um, and we're just going to go through that. Um, in each slide, there's a sort of particular statement about what I feel the power of listening uh, can achieve, can unearth, um, and can maybe make us uh, contemplate, which is why I present it to you here. Um, it's just in the hope that maybe um, something, uh, no more than Emily before, um, something is triggered, um, maybe something about a place um, it becomes uh, reignited within you um, and you begin to appreciate um, all of those environments that surround us every day. Obviously, the more you appreciate something, the less likely you are to go and destroy it. Um, so here we go.
So obviously as an artist, um, I've chosen to let such sounds um, from the environment infiltrate my practice and what I do. Um, but one of the most, one of the amazing things about these kinds of environments and these kinds of sounds is that they're, they're open to us all. Um, there's nothing, there's no sort of social class system, there's no, um, there's no restriction about who can listen, who can't, there's no right way to listen, there's no wrong way to listen. It's not subject on your education, it's not subject on you understanding um, music or um, science of uh, nature, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and really this very, very brief presentation um, was just an attempt to sort of uh, hopefully make people consider sound um, and consider it as um, the huge strength um, that it could be in maybe uh, making some kind of a change. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, that was extremely stimulating. Um, so uh, we're now going to move into the panel discussion. So I hope that what you've heard so far will maybe influence um, questions you might ask later and how you... Uh, uh, I hope it has influenced our panel as well in terms of how they might uh, approach their presentation. So we have a very interesting panel uh, which is uh, going to address the, the question, the core question tonight, which is communicating the challenge. Uh, what are the ways that we can reach people what are the uh, ways we can break through, reach new constituencies, uh, encourage more collaboration, and how can we create a new sense of possibility around climate change? So I'd just like to introduce our panel members. Um, unfortunately, uh, George Marshall, who had um, uh, agreed to travel uh, to be part of our panel, can't make it because he's had a close family bereavement. Uh, now, Eamon Ryan has agreed to step in. Eamon has also been involved in the climate gathering uh, from the start and uh, was with George Marshall in the Burren uh, when we had our first climate gathering. Uh, so Eamon is going to join the panel to um, impart some of, some of George's thinking and also uh, some of the material from the Burren. Um, in addition to Eamon, you may all know, is the leader of the Green Party and former Minister for Energy. Um, we also have with us today Claire O'Connor, who's a former international director of Al Gore's um, uh, Alliance for Climate Protection and also formerly uh, worked as head of policy and research for the UK Labour Party, if I'm right, uh, and is now working uh, for Centre Ground Communications and, and Bell Pottinger in, in the UK. Um, we have Terry Prone, who will be known to most of you as a, someone suggests I describe her as a communications guru. Uh, I'm not sure if that's how she describes herself, but she certainly has been involved over the many years in um, the whole business of communication, of get, getting your message across in various different ways, interpersonally as well as through the media. Uh, and then finally we have Ushin Coughlin, who is the director of Friends of the Earth, has been campaigning on climate change uh, here in Ireland uh, over many years um, and has been centrally involved in uh, various uh, campaigns around climate legislation and uh, energy and, and other issues. So I'd just like to ask our four panellists to uh, join me on the stage and we'll start the discussion. Thank you. Sorry about that. The, the, the lure of the lectern there was, uh, was uh, attracting some people, but we'll, we'll do it sitting down if that's okay with everyone as long as we can be hear, heard. So um, the idea is uh, that we will do, each of the panelists will give a, a, a short input based on what they've heard and what they will, uh, would like to uh, speak to us about community, communicating the challenge. Uh, I'm going to call on Eamon first uh, because uh, he may give us the, uh, some perspective on what George Marshall might have said if he was here, but also um, some of the lessons from the Burren Climate Gathering in 2013, which was really about this whole issue of how do we create new narratives on climate change. So Eamon, you wish to go ahead? Thank you. Um, 
George Marshall has a book out, Don't Even Think About It, about why our brains are wired to ignore climate change. I think I'd probably retitle myself, Don't Even Think, to try and explain what George is saying in my short, short few words, because he's far better qualified and, and skilled to do it. But I do want, if I can, Ryan, to reflect on our first climate gathering we had in the Burren, in the, Bally, in the Burren College of Art in Ballyvaughan uh, two years ago. George was at it, and I think some of the ideas that from there made it into this book. So I maybe that, from that basis, I can speak with experience uh, having been there. And it was interesting, with people from all over the world, the idea was to bring people to Ireland. Ireland is a meeting place where we would really think in an open way about climate. The fifth province thinking, safe space. Everyone comes as an equal. Every voice is respected. Um, and it was interesting, we had the top people in the world, a lot of top people, climate thinkers, who were, we all agreed in one thing, we're getting it wrong. It ain't working. Um, you go down to a pub tonight afterwards, into the kind of lounge or whatever, and uh, uh, watch a conversation where someone tries to raise the issue of climate change. Oh my God almighty, is at that time, <laughs> I've got to get home, there'll be embarrassed silence as you exit, exit stage left with the pint half drunk. Um, we've made people feel guilty about this issue. We've presented this huge big problem, or presenting what maybe seems to people as tiny solutions that doesn't really get to grips with the problem. Um, we've lost the, the broad public. There's an interest, there's people in this room here tonight who are interested in climate change or else you wouldn't be here. But we need to win the public. And what we were considering the burn is how we might do that. It was interesting to listen to Karen, and I thought that lesson about listening was probably the most important thing I think I'll get out of tonight. Because actually we came to the conclusion the first thing we need to do is start listening. Um, to give this up from the environmental movement as an issue. It's not no longer an environmental issue. This is an issue for everyone. And for myself, from 25 years campaigning, I suppose, as an environmentalist, whatever that means, it's, it, there was an agreement that we need to give it up. This needs to be owned by everyone. And maybe, if not everyone, certainly a much wider constituency than what traditionally maybe has seen as having an interest in it. We need to win farmers, we need to win bu builders, we need to win students, and we do that by listening to them, first of all, asking for help rather than telling them what to do. A certain few things, we took four days of kind of, actually in a fairly creative environment, trying to work out some of our thoughts, nothing is certain about it. There were certain kind of um, counterintuitive things that we came to, conclusions we came to. One is that we should admit there is real uncertainty in everything to do with this issue. The exact modeling of how climate's going to hit each particular country, we don't know. The exact solutions, we're not sure. I mean, I have a fair idea myself. I think it's going to be electrification, electric vehicles, and so on. But exactly what technology, exactly which technology, we're going to have to evolve this and see. And it was interesting in, in admitting that uncertainty, that argument that we should do in our communications of this issue, there was a fairly common theme that we should be bringing in the artistic community for three reasons. Firstly, they're used to dealing with uncertainty, this long and certain process. You start a painting, it changes as you go through, through the process. You play music, the tune changes as you re react to other people playing. So people from the creative world are used to dealing with uncertainty. Secondly, I suppose this is a broad sense, but where we're going, particularly let's take Ireland as a country we know about. I listen to what the likes of Mark Patrick Hederman down in Glenscore, which is saying, the cue will come from the cultural world. The, key will, the cue will not necessarily, where we go next as a people and as a country won't necessarily come from the economists or the scientists or the politicians for that matter. It may well come from our poets, our philosophers, or our musicians. So we should heed what they're thinking and saying. And last but not least, there was a brilliant Martin Hayes at our climate gathering. And he said something about the nature of conversations that maybe you could learn from music as well. He just a very simple way of uses this fiddle to talk. He says, uh, the conversation you could have where you kind of, music, you start with the melody, da -dum, ba -ba -dum, da -dum, -dum, and you apply with another melody, da -dum, ba -ba -da -ba -dum. I got the tune wrong there, I'm a hopeless fiddle player, but you get the idea that there's something in the nature of music that can teach us something about conversation, the sort of conversations we need to have. There was other counterintuitive stuff we learned. Um, one most difficult for me is, is uh, that we have to hasten slowly sometimes that as much as I see the urgency on this and the issues of what we decide to do in the next five years will actually determine what happens <coughs> in the next 50, how our land use, how our farming goes, how our buildings are built, our energy system, 
as much as there's a temptation to get it quickly, please, we've got to change, that that sense of exasperated urgency may be translated into people's ears as a, well, it's like your man is a bit intense. Uh, so we need to, the, the, the metaphor we had, someone gave up, right? Uh, sorry, not metaphor, it's a story they told of the Shannon Airsea rescue helicopter, when they get a phone call, it is a crisis. They gotta get out fast to a boat which is sinking out in the sea. And they're trained, the first thing they do is turn on the kettle. Stop, take a minute. What's the best thing for us to do? Grace O'Sullivan, um, former Greenpeace activist, people will know what she ran for us at the European elections last year. She said, told me something similar. She's a trained lifeguard. What happens, what's the first thing you're trained to do when you're someone's out, I'm drowning? First thing you do as a trained lifeguard is turn your back to the sea. Think, hold on a sec here now, what's the situation, what should I do? And I think in some ways that's very hard for us who've been campaigning on this issue for 25 years, but to just, let's just reflect for a minute. Let's get a think about this and then let's get our response right and go out like a helicopter team that knows what it's doing. Um, two or three other, I won't go into all of them now, I'll be very quick. Yeah. <laughs> One we spoke of was, we spoke about home narratives. We have to start stopping about the planet and speaking about home, bring this home to people and that the changes we need to make are, are, are changes their daily lives and they're better changes than the, to our lives. And we need to win people whose central instinct is to look after the home. What David Begg said earlier on about his grandchildren, that exists in all of us, left or right, Christian or not, atheist. We have a sense that we wanted to pass on to our next generation the love and the, the environment that we grew up in. So we need to speak about home is one of the things we said. And lastly, we need to speak about plan C, we called it. That if you're stopping people going from A to B, you've got to have a better alternative C. You can't just stop, they can't go there. We have a better alternative. My last line, where I think George is coming to, he comes to a lot of this stuff in his book. But what is that better way? And, and why do we talk about it? He, he talks about a col more collaborative model, cooperation. I hear this word collaboration all the time now. I read that letter from the Anglican bishops in England to the political system saying that we don't have a choice just between monopoly or competition. Or this, as you say, David, this dominance of narrow competitive view of the world in the last 30 years has got to go. And collaboration isn't, collaboration actually is a better, different way. And it isn't, going back to just monopoly, the state decides everything. It is this new collaborative model between the state and the market, and between all sorts of sectors, environmental movement and others. And it's that collaboration is what I'm most interested in now. I think this, I think this event and this whole series of events is, I hope, an example of such collaboration, where you have ICTU and IBEC and the environmental pillar and Troker and Christian Aid working together. And that's what I think uh, we're reflecting here tonight, which comes straight out of George's book. Thanks, Eamon. Uh, thanks for summarising what was an uh, extremely intense four days down in the burn, but uh, just some interesting principles there that are, that are, are worth thinking about. Uh, I'd next like to ask Oisín uh, Coughlin from Friends of the Earth to maybe give a campaigner's perspective on this, uh, because I think from a campaigner's point of view, it's not all about communication. I think that's maybe one of your messages uh, without, without stealing your script. But <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> so yeah, I, I've been working on climate change as director of Friends of the Earth for 10 years, uh, and the first thing to say is I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to give it up, and I hope I have been always uh, as not only an environmental issue. Indeed, uh, I, I strive communicating it from a different perspective initially, but I, I'll, I'll reflect on that briefly. But I think, I mean, George Marshall says in his book some of the things that, that make this issue difficult. It's the very nature of it. It's remote in time and space. It, it, it seems remote. It'll be in the distant future, or it'll be far away from where we are now. It's, it's intangible, the CO2 is invisible, it's interwoven in our everyday lives, it's not a discrete uh, something outside ourselves that we, can, that we can blame someone else for. We can find and pick villains, but we're all implicated in this blameless crime in a sense. We didn't know we were causing um, climate change when we started burning fossil fuels, and it's taken us a while to, to get to, to face that reality, I guess. And of course as well, we face immediate costs when we act to contain it, and the benefits are some way down the line later in our lives or in our <coughs> children's lives. All of those things, I think, make it difficult for us to act. And particularly for politicians, who are the principal people that we call on to act as campaigners, uh, because they face a 24-7 news cycle, they face a five-year face, face five electoral cycle. So working in longer time frames is, as we say, at least, the very least challenging for them. 
uh, twice and they spent uh, uh, they got to those 10 years, eight years uh, focusing on the idea of a climate change law to give a framework to how our political system uh, interacts with the issue. Uh, but I do think, so those, those realities face people working in climate change wherever they are. I do think, though, there are some, thing, some things that are, are specific to Ireland, which is that uh, we are one of the, well, I think we take our green, we just passed Patrick's Day, we I think we take our green image for granted. It's part of our international and our national identity and our psyche and our flag and our politics. And I think actually we've assumed for a long time we're also green environmentally because of our landscape and so on. And actually, to some degree, that was always true. We are one of the few, if not the only, territory in the world that still has a significantly lower population than we did in 1841. Now, of course, population isn't the only factor involved in, uh, in impacting the environment. But equally, we, we didn't have an industrial revolution in, mo in, in most of the, 20, the counties of, of the island, uh, certainly in the 26 counties. Uh, so until the 1990s, we were much less impactful on our environment than the average uh, European. And then came our boom. And we didn't want to hear anything other than this was our coming out party. We were going to enjoy not being poor any longer. We were going to binge, basically, as we sometimes do in alcohol as well. Uh, and nobody was allowed to say, hang on, is this, is this the right way to go? Is this the right way to use our newfound affluence? There was a period, I think, though, between 2002 and 2007, where we began to take that settled after, at that affluence a bit more for granted, uh, that, those, that higher income. And we began to see other issues dominate our, our political discourse, health care, child care, elder care, and the emergence, possibly, of planet care as well. And indeed, uh, um, David mentioned earlier the idea of, of, of GDP and whether it was a good measure. I heard David himself in those years talk about you know, great economic growth and ask the question, growth for what purpose? We've got to a stage now we should question our economic model. And then what happened, just as that might have become the new framework, we had an almighty crash. So we went, you know, right back to our growth for what purpose? Growth for jobs, growth for debt, debt eases. So the moment where we could have moved to a, to a, to a, a broader, more holistic, longer term uh, um, uh, thinking was snatched away from us. And, and, and the recessions made dealing with these issues that we're talking about tonight even more difficult. So in those 10 years, and I'll try to be, be brief now, like we've tried a, a, a range of, of narratives, of ways of selling stories, although I'm not a storyteller, I'm a rationalist uh, campaigner and planner type, so it's been a challenge for me. But we've talked about things like responsibility. I came, like David Begg, from the overseas aid sector and was struck when I got to this sector that you know, we would have been very proud of being the sixth most generous country in the world uh, for overseas aid per person among rich countries. Um, just a shock to discover that we were also the sixth most climate polluted country in the world per person in the rich world. That was a, 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 a irreconcilable difference, so to speak. And you know, it led us to a, con to a conversation about our responsibility, our fair shares. And it gets people engaged to a point, they were shocked by that, but not to a point of saying, well, let's, let's rework our economic system. Uh, so you talk about risk, you talk about the Gulf Stream. I remember talking about 10 years ago, you talk about the stern stuff, that it's 10, you know, 20, 10 times, 20 times cheaper to act now than to act to the consequences. And we've made comparisons with the financial crisis. But uh, you know, none of those things have, have led to any sort of transformation. And so you talk also about reward, about opportunity, about the fact that there's renewable energy, about the fact that we have win-win wins on, on, uh, on investment. Uh, uh, for in retrofitting, for example, we, you get jobs, you get lower energy bills, you get, you get lower emissions, you, get, you put construction workers back to work. And again, you, you get interest in that. But none of those things, even together, have, have, have brought us to a point of, of a tipping point of action. And I, there's, you know, there's probably better stories we could tell, or we could tell them differently, like we're, like we're exploring tonight. But I do think there are also limits to communication. And I'll give you uh, one example from the, from the policy sphere, which was the issue of the carbon tax. Uh, a tax that, that the economists said this was the least disruptive, in fact, less than disruptive, as the economic efficient way to, uh, to move us, to begin to shift us towards, um, uh, towards uh, um, uh, less polluting uh, behavior. Uh, so when the government, uh, consulted last on it, before it was introduced, this is b before it was introduced in 2010, back in 2004, it's, it's been on the books for years. Um, they didn't ask the question, uh, they, si they simply asked, do you want a new tax? To which the answer was, not surprisingly, no. One of the reasons being that, of course, those who were most affected by the imposition of a carbon tax uh, were informed, organized, and vocal. And those who would have faced lower costs if we'd had a carbon tax. Uh, weren't informed, weren't organized, weren't particularly vocal, and in fact, in some cases, of course, weren't even born if we're talking about children down the line. So, of course, they got the vast majority of the people who responded to that, to that uh, um, uh, consultation said, no thanks, we won't have a tax. And the last thing Charlie McCready did before he left for Brussels was to, was to scrap it. 
And yet the real question, the framing question that should have been put in place, and this is where I think leadership comes in from po politics, before I talk about the campaigners very briefly, yeah. is that uh, the actual question was, we face 600 million euro in fines, or they didn't like the word fines, but in costs, if we don't meet our Kyoto targets and we're not on track to meet our Kyoto targets. So we have two ways of dealing with that. We could have a carbon tax, which will reduce our pollution, reduce our overshoot, overshoot reduce our bill, our, our, our bill. Uh, and our bill will be paid by the polluter. The less you pollute, the less you'll pay. So we can do it that way, or we can not have a carbon tax. It will have a higher bill, and we'll just take the money from your pockets, from your PAYE and your VAT to buy those overseas credits. So no matter how you, much you reduce your emissions, it'll make no difference. We'll still take the money from you and we'll pay it overseas. That framing didn't happen. There was no political leadership. They just asked, would you like a new tax? And they got the, 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 uh, the answer that they got. And they chose the path of least political resistance. And I think that's why you need political leadership. I think like some of the messages that, if, if the messages that I've mentioned now are that, are that George uh, mentioned in his book were being said again and again and again by our politicians at, at, in a leadership way, I think that would change the discourse. I, do, I don't think they're without power. But I also think we can't wait around for them. Because as a campaigner, I'm more and more convinced that we need to mobilize, and in fact that there isn't a way, I mean, George hopes you can convince anybody and everybody by communication. I don't think, and I'm with this, with, and with this and with David Roberts from Grist.org in the US, I don't think he convinced the Tea Party with any matter of stories or engagement or music that they should care about climate change for reasons of culture and identity, not as opposed to reasons of science or, 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 or kind of rationality. And I, equally, there's, you're going to run into vested interests along the way, as, as we did with the carbon tax, and as you would as, as when we tackle fossil fuels, as you will there. I think that, think that can only be met by also organizing, by also mobilizing. In the way we're seeing 350.org and the fossil fuel movement and the divestment movement, that has a part to play. Uh, we, need, we need the creative communications, but we're going to need to organize, mobilize, and campaign as well. Thanks, Oshin. <clears throat> So, so, Claire, um, would you be willing to give us a few minutes on sure. your thoughts on this issue? Um, it's, my, uh, it's my absolute pleasure. Um, the other two climate gatherings that Eamon organised, I was unable to make. The first was on my uh, mum's 60th birthday, the one he held in County Clare, where my dad's from. The second gathering was on my daughter's first birthday, and tonight is my sister's 30th birthday, <laughs> so I'm beginning to think it's conspiring against me, but um, I've got special dispensation from my sister to be here tonight, so it is a great pleasure. Um, and I do want to thank Eamon, I think, and Ryan for creating this space, um, I think, to reflect on this issue, because in our day-to-day -day lives and, you know, the jobs that we all do, I think um, we don't often take that time to listen to think and to reflect, so um, I'm very grateful. So in the interest of listening, um, I do want to hear what you all have to say, so I'm going to limit myself to five points. Obviously I could be here all night talking to you about all these different experiences and thoughts that I've had, but five points, so we can, uh, we can expand on any of them in the Q&A, but um, I want to talk about um, sort of the framework uh, if you like, about why we're here this evening. I want to talk a bit about framing, a bit about the sort of the guru of this, Frank Luntz, drawing on him. I want to tell you a bit about um, uh, sort of the collaborative, the, the work that we did at the Alliance for Climate Protection. I'm calling that point friends and foe. You're hearing the F theme here, I think. Uh, the fourth, I want to tell you a bit about the price freeze and how the issue is playing out in the UK in the sort of forthcoming election. And finally, I want to just end bringing it home, as you say, Eamon, and talking about when you're brushing your teeth tonight. You know, so it helps me to think like, why are we here tonight? Like it's Wednesday night, it's the night after St Patrick's Day. Why are you all here? Climate gathering to have a climate conversation. Um, you know, and so so much of our work, and I agree with a lot of what you said. You know, we talk about this issue in terms of the the science, the technicalities, the economics. Um, but here we are tonight, like trying to think about it and sort of feel it almost. Are you seeing the sort of the artist's installations and thinking? Um, I think why, you know, why is that deeper understanding of how we feel this issue important? And I think, um, you know, in the papers you, and on the news, you're probably hearing all about your climate change bill. You know, a lot of the time this issue. We talk about it in terms of policies and it's the political debate 
about you know, whether you're for re renewable energy or energy efficiency, when in actual fact there's broad, you know, there's generally broad consensus of like the public's preferences when it comes to this issue, uh, particularly in sort of energy, uh, the sort of transformation of the energy system. You know, we're generally for more renewable energy. We're generally for a shift away from fossil fuels on the demand side, more sort of demand side management. So all those policies, if you like, those preferences, are generally, you know, there's some consensus around those. We can argue about the detail. But underpinning all of that are sort of the values, um, the cultural values, if you like. And uh, I, I know a lot of what George talks about and others are sort of values. And it's worth just pausing for a minute to think about what we mean by that. And it, it's sort of those guiding principles um, that, that it, those policies, you know, for them to sort of get any traction and for this transformational change to take place, those policies and preferences have to be sort of underpinned by those values, have to go with the grain of those values. Those values could be about, um, I don't know, sort of efficiency or reducing waste. It could be about autonomy and freedom. We talk about the Tea Party. It could be about, you know, social justice. Um, it, it, sort of their sort of value systems, if you like, and we can talk more about those. But I think it's why it's important to pause and sort of think. And those values are dependent on our world experience. You know, the, the values are how we sort of want the world to be, how we think the world ought to be. They're tempered quite a lot by how we think the world is, our, our view of reality. That's where a lot of pragmatism can come in or compromise. Um, you know, um, and we can think about like a long-term change, and you know, we see this issue as very much the long-term trajectory is, but we're sort of starting. We're not starting with a blank piece of paper, or you know, it's how the world is right now. So, um, so I think that's why it's worth thinking about what underpins all that um, and the values and the cult. And they change by different culture, and they also change very much in terms of context. And the, the values that we bring to bear, if you like, the values are still there, but the ones we bring to bear on an issue change as the context changes. Like after the Great Recession, if you like, certain values about affordability and come to the fore um, after sort of the Fukushima uh, a natural disaster or Hurricane Sandy. The, when the context changes, sort of the values that we use. So having sort of thought a bit about that intellectual framework, I want you to sort of set that aside because... The framing, the framing issue uh, Oshin talked a bit about, and Frank Luntz, I'm sure many of you have heard of him, um, the sort of the communications guru. He did lots of work in like polling and sort of thinking about words and the meaning of words. He was the one that um, taught, worked a lot with the Republicans and Newt Gingrich in America. Uh, he taught, he coined the phrase like the death tax, and you know, rather than, you know, who here is for a death tax? Nobody. Who here is for an inheritance tax? You know, quite perhaps many of you. I don't know. Um, uh, who here is for sort of energy exploration? Quite a lot. And when, or if you sort of think about that in terms of oil drilling, less so. So he, you know, he was the guru of this sort of framing issue and the author of this um, infamous memo to the Republicans in 2002. So that's 13 years ago now. When he told them talk more in terms of climate change because it's sort of less dramatic than global warming. And if I urge you, you know, one thing you could do after this is, you know, Google his memo, it's, on, it's online, and you read it all in terms of how you communicate about this issue. I think there's some really uh, insights, really good insights in there. Incidentally, in 2010, he came out and said he believed in climate change and it is sort of man-made. Um, so we could talk a lot more about the framing of it and, you know, I think you have, and when I was with uh, Al Gore's Alliance for Climate Protection, we did a lot of framing. We sort of you talked in terms of sort of the military and energy security, and we'd got, we got our army generals to go out in the country and talk about it. We got hip hop, we had a hip hop tour of uh, hip hop artists to go and talk, yes, you know, talk, sing, rap about it to young people. We got businessmen, Chinese businessmen coming over to the US to talk. We framed it in so many different ways. Um, but on the alliance, we, it, was a very, it was a campaigning organization, in fact. And I think Al Gore learned something from how Obama organized his campaign. And sort of, it was such a close issue. 
the purpose of the organization was to sort of get legislation in the US, clean energy and climate change legislation. This was sort of 2009 when Obama got elected. And so it was very sophisticated and it focused on 18 states. You know, eight, first of all, 22 sort of went down to 18 senators that we needed to swing. How are we going to talk about this issue? Create the space for them to vote in the right way. And we tried everything, you know, all these different frames. I remember doing some focus groups um, like with women, you know, again, um, you know, how can we talk about this issue to sort of get women sort of mobilized and moved by it? Um, you know, so many different ways which we could talk more about. Um, but we didn't get the votes. Uh, we were unable to move people enough at that point in time for various reasons. But one thing I took away from the, uh, my time there was this the thing that you're trying to do here tonight and all the sponsors of this event, this ev event tonight is that collaboration. It was called the Alliance because it was about bringing people together. And I think to the detriment of the cause of the issue, it's become very polarized for so long, especially in the United States. It's become part of people's, I don't know, for want of a better word, part of people's like shtick. I don't know if that word translates here at all, but you know, whatever the science says, even sometimes whatever your value system say, you know, it's just your, it's a cultural identifier. You know, whether you're for or against gun control, for or against abortion, for or against climate change. You know, you can be a very rational human being, but it's just a cultural identifier that you want to, you're against this because, um, it, you know, it's part of your group. So the alliance was about bringing people together, friends and foe alike. We did lots of ads where we had Nancy Pelosi and Newt Gingrich sitting on the same couch talking about the issue. Ads online where we had Coke, Coca-Cola and Pepsi you know, who never collaborate, come together to say, no, we both believe in this issue, this is important. So anything you can do to bring different bits together, I think is really important. The price freeze, I think I'll leave to later, yeah, we sure can talk about that. Yeah. Um, to just finally, um, when I was talking to my sister last night, bring, bringing it home, um, as we were celebrating her birthday, um, when I said to her, you know, I'm going to this thing tomorrow night, you know, communicating climate change, you know, I've known her all her life, but we rarely talk about this issue. And I said, so, you know, what do you think about climate change? How, you know, what would you say about communicating climate change? She, you know, she had the usual sort of back and forth. Um, she couldn't leave, actually, at that point, uh, as you said. Um, but one thing she said that struck me, she said, um, when I brush my teeth at night, I turn the tap off. That is about climate change to me. And I was like... Mm. She said, I think of my grandkids, she doesn't have any kids yet, uh, I think of my grandkids and I turn the tap off. And I, I just, that, just struck, that just stuck with me all day, you know, when I sort of think, um, I think, so my, my thing tonight when I was sort of thinking, what message do I want to impart? Like, we can talk about all of these sort of like technicalities and how you communicate and framing and campaigning. But if the purpose of tonight is, you know, for us all to sort of, not think about it, but sort of feel it, like you were saying, when it becomes real. I think, you know, my one ask of everybody is sort of when we all go home tonight and brush our teeth and look in the mirror and think about it and think, just think about this issue, you know, what it means to us, um, how we feel about it, you know, um, how, do we, how do we talk to our friends and family in a way that sort of get them to think about it and feel it? Because... I think w if unless we take it back to basics like that, you know, take it home, um, I don't think we're going to get sort of the big transformational change with your climate change bill or at the COP or whatever else. So I'll stop there. I yep. probably went way over. Thank you, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, Terry, you've, you've heard the first three speakers. Um, you're very interested in your thoughts and reactions? Well, I just want to react to the last one. And I'm very conscious that this is being recorded for later public consumption. So I will endeavor not to be libelous. <laughs> <laughs> However, having appeared just before the last general election on three television programs with Frank Luntz, I would suggest that if he is to be described as a communications guru, Nobody better ever describe me as one. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing is that Emily raised an interesting thing earlier. She asked us all to think of, and I may be 
not getting it exactly right, but more or less the person or the situation who, who converted us. And I realized that I was converted during my teens by a book and by everything that happened around that book. And it is just possible that there may be somebody in this group here tonight who's old enough to remember the publication of that book. It may not be, but I hope so. The book was called Silent Spring. And it was written by a woman. And the woman said that pesticides were so dangerous to the world that if we didn't start banning them, particularly one very effective one called DDT, the shells of songbirds' eggs would get thinner and thinner and thinner until one year we had a silent spring. And it stopped my heart, the thought of it. And it did the same to people all over the world. There was no goddamn conversation, there was conversion. There was an absolute passionate determination. This must stop. Now, it was much simpler than where we are today. You could ban one thing, and DDT was banned. But it did much more than that. It gave me a sense, gosh, a book, an idea, and the communications around it can change the world. And that's what I believe to this day. Because I was a teenager. I had a father who was, how can I put this positively? <laughs> he was born a contrarian. And he believed that as a trade union leader, trade unionism was basically all that counted. And don't waste his time with this environmental crap. And so. He held on to his can of DDT for many years. I don't know where it eventually ended up. And he also used to cherish the fact that he claimed Hitler had said that he wouldn't need planes or armament to take Ireland. He could do it with a can of DDT. Despite that, and despite the revisionism that has happened down the years, because it is now believed by many people that the banning of DDT has killed thousands of humans because of the resurgence of malaria, the notion that communication can change the world if we get it right, if we continue to get it right, if we never let it go. This is not about spin. This is not about um, sending out messages. That's what on post does. <laughs> this is about converting people one by one throughout the world and in our own homes. And because I was so anxious, because I believe today is very important, because I was so anxious about today, I couldn't do you know when you have something in the back of your mind, you keep mentioning it to people who look at you very strangely? I had a client in today, and I said to him, listen, um, why don't you care about climate change? <laughs> this is a fairly new client. <laughs> and he bristled. And he said, I bloody well do care about climate change. I care passionately about climate change. I try to seek to make my business sustainable. I am already looking into uh, carbon, what's it, the thing where you do swaps because he has to take so many flights. He said, have you seen the footage of the ice shelf collapsing? And that ice shelf, he said, was the height of an 80-story building. And I'm looking at him in admiration and astonishment. And just before we parted, a thought struck me. And I said, by the way, um, what newspaper do you read? <laughs> and he said, as if I had accused him of infidelity in some <laughs> basic way, The Guardian, of course. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, right. Could have figured that one. <laughs> <laughs>
and I'll come back to that in a moment. I then came back and had a brief word with my head of training. Now, my head of training is heading off to train in the Philippines very, uh, at this coming weekend. He has two small children, and his wife recently got rear-ended in that. Do you remember the, the uh, multiple collision on the M50? She got in the middle of that. And so he's kind of preoccupied. And I said to him, why do you not care about climate change? <laughs> And there was a long silence, and he said, you wrong me. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah. He said, I really do care about climate change. It is number 16 on the list of things I really care about right now. <laughs> and that's the problem. That's the task, is to make climate change relevant, important, to people at the moment who have it number 16 on their list. And I just want to say one thing about The Guardian. We need always, when we're communicating, to divide the people that we talk to into three groups. The already converted, in this case, who buy The Guardian, right? <laughs> Probably many of us here. There's no point in talking to them. You have them already. At the other end, you have the unconvertible, the Tea Party. Some major capitalists, they're unconvertible. All you can do is coerce them in time. Let's not knock coercion and shame. <laughs> it worked real well in the cigarette, in, in the workplace thing. But in the middle, there's always a small group of people who are not imprinted, who haven't made up their mind, who are ready for conversion. Because do you know the one thing that never changes? People want to believe. And people want to act. And people want to feel good about taking action for other people. And that's what has to be tapped into. <laughs> Thank you very much, Terry. Um, it's interesting you mentioned the Guardians. Uh, some, myself and some colleagues who, in working in this game used to refer to the Guardian as escapist literature because it allowed you to escape to a world where people <laughs> cared about climate change as their top. <laughs> so you could read it, and for 10 minutes, everyone agreed with you. Um, so uh, thank you very much to the panelists, and particularly thank you for, for keeping your contributions short because I want to, to make sure we have time for this uh, next session. Um, one of the people I forgot to thank at the very start is Chris Chapman, who's standing over here someone who has uh, helped us with the climate gathering from the very start and has been instrumental in, in keeping this phase of it alive. I'm going to hand over to Chris now, who's going to lead you through a quick exercise before we get into the Q&A with the panel and the discussion. Uh, I think this exercise will, will really um, help frame that very, in an interesting way. Okay. If, does that work? Great. So we're going to ask you to do two things very quickly. And the point of this is that we want to have conversations that go somewhere. It's not enough just that we had a nice evening or an interesting evening. You know, we're at the beginning of something that's going to go somewhere. So hopefully, under everyone's seat, there's a coloured bit of card. So if everyone wants to bend down, find their bit of card, hopefully that works. Okay, this is suitably chaotic, but it's good to move a little bit. Please, back away, yeah, of course. We're supposed, to, we're supposed to have a chat amongst ourselves as well, so. <laughs> we there or thereabouts? Or you can tweet. Yeah, which I'm checking. And indeed, there's some bits of cards on the table as well oh, for the friends on the stage. Now, shh, if we can just go quiet again, now we've got our bits of card. This is the bit where it goes wrong. So this relies on everyone having access to a pen. So here we begin the collaborative economy because not everyone will have a pen with them. On one side of the card, we're going to collect these in at the end, on one side of the card, can you write the dominant feeling that comes up for you when climate change comes up in the media? Yeah? So when you open the newspaper and there's a feature about climate change, or when you turn on the radio and they're talking about it, whatever it is, what's the dominant feeling that comes up? It can be 
anything you want. Anger, confusion, hope, joy, depression, scared. Right on one side, the dominant feeling that comes up. So we're going to take this in and we'll use this as part of the beginning of the next event, which Ryan's going to talk about the series of events. So this is just a taking the temperature. When climate change comes up in the media, what's the dominant feeling that comes up for you? Okay, I'm hoping that's kind of one word, but I know in the real world for some people that will be slightly more than one word. On the other side of your piece of card, I want you to write something, but talk a little bit to a neighbour about this first. On the other side of your piece of card, I want you to write down the question you would love the partners to this event to collaborate on. So in some ways all this climate change stuff can be really confusing and a bit all over the place and is it about climate change, is it about changing the entire basis of the economy, is it about global justice, is it about consumerism, you know, what, what's it about, is it about you know, looking at things in a different way, listening in a different way. So have a quick conversation with a neighbour for just about two minutes and then we'll tell you when we're coming to the end of the two minutes. And then I want you just to write down a really good question that you would like the partners, so ICTU, IBEC, um, Christian Aid, TROCRA, the Environmental Pillar, the, part, the Climate Gathering, the partners to this event, a really good question that you'd like them to collaborate around, just to help really focus their effort. Okay, so two minutes, talk to a neighbour, what's a really good question? We'll tell you when the time's really uh, nearly up and get you to write the question down on your bit of card. So it's only right that you should overrun as well. So if we can just come quiet. So, as I say, we're going to collect the cards up uh, at, at the end of the evening. So we'll, if we can kind of move them to the end of the rows or leave them on your chairs, we'll make sure we don't lose those and we feed them into the next event. Let's just take a few of them. So are there, are there a few people, we've got two microphones, a few people who would be happy to share their feeling and their question. And then we'll come back to questions for the panel as well. So right at the back here, hello. Hi, my name is Sinead uh, Moore, and I, well, just, just one big feeling that I have is overwhelm uh, when I think about climate change. I think that, you know, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to bring up two children. I need to drive a car because of where I work. It's miles away from my house. Um, I didn't want to drive a car, but I kind of felt I had to because my children were getting wet, um, you know, waiting around for buses that didn't come on time. So the question is, how can you balance uh, having a, a sort of a, a lifestyle and the challenge of uh, living an environmentally friendly life. Thank you. So we'll, we'll alternate different sides of the room. So somebody from the other side of the room. Um, well, the first thing was, how do you feel when uh, the issue is raised in the media? Well, I suppose I'd be delighted that um, it was, you know, on. So my first thing would be, you know, the more the merrier. Um, I think it's great that The Guardian's doing a, a feature on it, but uh, mainstream media. So I'm, I'm just pleased, and I actually would tend to write into RT if they raise it now, because I think they need to be praised to be encouraged to do it more. And then um, I suppose in terms of what I'd like to see to come from this, and uh, would be uh, engaging people in uh, the action to bring about uh, change and to bring about a different value system. And I suppose this is where I put on my, I've been a, an environmentalist and an activist for, for most of my life, but um, I've also have my, uh, my I have, I'm an artist, so um, I, I would think of creative ways to do that. And one of the ways that I've been trying to engage people in, in the issue is to uh, work on a game. And I'm working on prototypes for a game where you have a carbon allowance and you uh, can't use that up in the day or the book of carbon comes along and gets you that night. So um, I'm thinking that people that are playing casual games are not generally people that are interested in climate change. But actually, if you look at the carbon footprint of the world, and then you look at the, the, the um, amount of people that are playing casual digital games, they almost correlate. You've got 240 uh, million Chinese playing casual games. You've got 89% of the population of the US that are online playing casual social media games. And it's also an age group a profile of 35 to 50 
year olds that are not engaged in the issue. So I just think, what would the panel think about the idea of, of, of bringing casual games? Because I think games have always been a way that people have learned. And it means that you're not feeling guilty because you start to make small little incremental changes in your game and your gamification. And then you start to bring those into the world and there's rewards straight away. So there's instant reward systems. So there's no guilt. And you begin to bring about uh, small little changes in your home value system. And I hope to find a day where people don't have their value system based on, uh, I think, Last week I was at a social entrepreneur thing Donna, actually in the RDS, just a quick word there yeah, because quick, they asked when it brought up about the Celtic Tiger, the, the questionnaire, he brought up the thing, he said who would like to be back in the time of the Celtic Tiger, now this was made up of business people from across the world, they weren't all social entrepreneurs and it was, um, and they asked who would like to be back in the Celtic Tiger and not one person put their hand up, so I think that's really positive because I think the value system has changed and I think we need to work on okay, that. Thanks Donna, thanks Ruth. Uh, I just uh, put down for when I see it in the in the uh, papers. Uh, I delight to see that the issue has been is being looked at, and then the question I think that uh, that we need to ask is the whole area of relationship. How uh, can we create a greater sense that we are part of? the whole creation process and not apart from <coughs> that uh, relationship with ourselves, beginning with our, ourselves of who we are in a greater sense of our connectedness to ourselves, to others, to creation, and ultimately as well to God. Okay, thank you. We might take one more from this side and then we'll move on to questions to the panel, I think, yeah? So, uh, David, <coughs> is there somebody indicating here? Um, yeah, hi. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's very important that we're talking about getting the message across and the methods we use for that. But I think also, and it is of quite immediate concern, I think, um, in, in this country as well as other places, we have to look at, you know, what the message is. I mean, I attended something um, about 18 mon months ago in County Leitrim, where I live, which is an area that's under immediate threat of fracking. And uh, somebody there said that, he considered shale gas to be a clean gas, you know, a bridge fuel. And we've done quite a bit of research in, in the interim on this. I have one here from Professor uh, Robert Howard of um, Cornell University. And, you know, the real research shows that shale gas, including its fugitive emissions and so on, is actually worse than burning coal. So I think, you know, it isn't just the, how we get the message over, it's what the message is. And I know that our government here is gung-ho for shale still, and they ignore the, the actual scientific uh, research. And I believe the IPCC, as I was in touch with someone, the Irish rep from the IPCC, is coming to a similar conclusion that shale gas is not a clean bridge fuel. It's as bad as coal. Thanks. So, so uh, I'm very happy for people to ask questions to the panel or to make a point if you wish. But I would ask you, in either case, just to keep it very brief, because we want to bring in as many people as possible and bring the panel in at the end. So if you could bear in mind to be brief. Thank you. OK, thank you, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Great. OK, will I stand up? Yeah. As you wish. <laughs> no. You don't know where they are. My name is Connor Scott. I've just got a couple of little things. Uh, the overall feeling is concern. And my question will be, what changes to our own behavior do we need to make to mitigate the effects of climate change? Thank you. OK, um, over here, yeah. Another, Connor. Uh, okay. My question is, uh, how do we go about changing the communications uh, from uh, one which is about reducing emissions to reducing emissions enough? Uh, that's not just enough to have, have change, but enough change to, to achieve the scientific imperative. <coughs> Hello, my name is Graham Stowe and I just want to start by saying I really appreciated the focus on the arts that this uh, particular conference has taken because uh, I'm, I'm a writer and I've come to this issue not really out of concern for climate change, although I've developed that concern since, but uh, in the course of doing research for, for my book. Um, and, and what strikes me now tonight is that there's a huge elephant in the room which is the issue of overpopulation. Uh, it's not really been addressed by any of the panelists, and 
So my own book is about the link between overpopulation, poverty, and climate change. And I was wondering if the panelists could speak to that, please. Thank you. I'm Michael McClintock. I've asked to be short, so I will be very short. Please. The question that I think we, you should be addressing is how to debunk the naysayers. The scientists, the science is overwhelming as far as I'm concerned, but it's so easy for the Koch brothers and the Tea Party to say it's rubbish. We need a response to that. Jack O'Sullivan, I get the feeling, looking around on the internet, that there's a growing number of people and organizations, I've, some of them I've never heard of before, and every time I go on the internet I find a new one, that are seriously, seriously concerned about climate change. And the feeling I get is like an egg is about to hatch. That something, enough of a pressure is building up, there's enough of a combined mass there that there will be a great change. Either that or those who are in denial about climate change will manage to, to crush it enough. And I think that links in with what Terry Prone was saying about how we communicate. And as regards books, I also feel that Silent Spring was great. But another great influence, and this goes back to what uh, Father Kennedy was saying, Teilhard de Chardin and Thomas Berry, who really bring forward so well that we have evolved out of the planet and we're not separate from it in any way. Thank you. Thank you. David, you have someone over there? Oh, hi. Um, it's just a quite a practical question. I guess it's the reason we're, we're all here today. Um, and Connor uh, touched on it. Um, what I'd really like to know is, what's the best way to get the engagement of the public that's needed to, to generate solutions to reduce CO2 emissions on a mass scale basis? That's, that's the big question. Um, thank you, uh, Miren is my name. We haven't mentioned uh, agriculture, and my question, for the panel is, I mean, I am not vegan, but many of my friends are vegan, and they believe that the importance of, I suppose, changing your diet, and I suppose in Ireland it's kind of difficult because of the lobby of the IFA and the whole agribusiness, and I know that in other countries like in Brazil and other countries in South America it's very difficult. So my question to you is, do we need to change our diet? Will this change? And I suppose in Ireland it seems to be very difficult because of the lobby of the diet industry. Thank you. So I'll take one more on each side before we go back to the panel. So is there somebody over here? Hi, uh, Roger Yates. Uh, following on from the last contribution, the elephant in the room actually, and it's a global elephant if you watch a film called Cowspiracy, is animal ag agriculture. Now I know there's a session set aside for that in um, April, I, I believe. So I hope that there's going to be a good engagement with that big issue, probably the biggest issue in terms of climate change. And uh, Caroline Conroy here. Um, just want to know how you can make it relevant to everyday living, like make it tangible, if it's small and simple to start with. Because what happens is a lot of people get overwhelmed by the big picture and then the message is lost completely. So how do we do that? I, I just see, if I'll sneak in one person more, if you don't mind, Chris, just here, and then we'll, uh, oh, uh, that one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, go, so Gavin, and then, uh, it's actually a lady at the back there, yeah. yeah. Um, it may seem like, a, I suppose, a deviant uh, perspective, but um, uh, I, I, I'm, suppose, with uh, many years of experience in this area, coming to perhaps uh, a sense that a narrative around failure is something that we need to address. I mean, it may well be, and I'm not a bookie, but the odds could suggest that we may, we may not actually tackle this issue. And is there room for a narrative of failure? And can people respond to a narrative of failure in a way that may, um, that may generate perhaps some positive progress? But um, I, I think that this is something that, I, that I'm personally grappling with and, and certainly um, you know, tackles, tackle, I think it, it's something that we need to address if we're going to take this issue into a place that becomes genuine and real. Thanks. So final, um, final question. Karen, Karen. Dubsky, Coast Watch. Yeah, it's sort of related to the last question. Does the panel think that we need more better indicators of whether we are making a difference as individuals, as family, as a local region? Because at the moment, some people feel that they can't make a difference, that they are so tiny in the big picture. So do you think that indicators might help? 
Okay, thank you very much all. Uh, I had promised people watching the live stream that if they asked questions on Twitter, I'd put some of them to the panel, so I've been looking there, but no, no one has asked a question. So <laughs> The people who want to ask questions are all in this room, so a, a good long list of questions there to address. I'm not going to call anyone in particular. If anyone wants to in indicate they want to address any of those questions, otherwise I'll just... Eamon, yeah, go ahead. Um, one of the things George Marshall uh, is saying and not only him, but a lot of people in the campaign movement now, is we, need, we made a fundamental mistake in the last 20, 30 years in this issue that we concentrated on the emissions and personal responsibility. And actually what he's saying is we should have gone at, from the, at, at the start of the, of the pipeline. So instead of at the end point to the consumer, we should have started with the fossil fuels because we know that they have to stay in the ground, four-fifths of them. And it may be easier for us politically, getting public support, to say, no, sorry, we're not going to use, we're not going to be burning peat. That's, and this, this is not popular. Carol August Murray was telling me earlier on today, she put a blog post out last Friday. It lit up because she dared to say that we should, we're, we're, we're going to have to stop burning turf. Um, but we are, if we're going to be serious about this issue. And, and, and coal, and gas, and oil. And, and we're going to have to change that. The same way we, we changed the petrol pumps out of unleaded, we're going to have to stop the petrol pump. We're going to literally have to mean, when you drive into a forecourt, that will be the dwindling last option. That option will disappear in the next 20 or 30 years because we will have organized ourselves through the political system to put in the replacement that is now, we know, available, is becoming available. And so, I, and I think that answers maybe several of the questions that are out there that I think we need to shift from putting this personal sense of guilt uh, George Marshall also writes, just briefly, um, he says we can learn from our religions about how the way some of these, uh, how come we don't have some uh, forgiveness space for people here? You know, if you just create this pure guilt feeling, actually it doesn't quite work. You do need some sense that we get people out of that and actually on a more positive stream um, that will allow them to support the fundamental changes that are needed. Lastly, and I think Terry put it best in terms of how will we get people to do this? I think that sense of pride in being part of a shared undertaking of real scale, that, uh, that innate human instinct, I want to be part of I mean, for God help us, people went to war. Their sons went off to Gallipoli. And out of that sense, some of them have a shared adventure in something bigger. Could we not have a collaborative shared global venture to tackle this issue? And I mentioned grain because I, I, I fundamentally think that the shared ambition is that we will feed and shelter and clothe and provide a meaningful, wealthy existence for nine billion on this people on this planet. I think that can be done. That's the big, fill my heart, sense of ambition project. And we've got to do it in one generation. I mean, that's, that's what we've got to do. So that, they don't come bigger than that. But I, 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 think, I think we can do it. And that's what we need to inspire. And inspire people that, my God, Ireland is bloody good at it. Because that's when we tend to work well, when we think, that the reason we're not football hooligans is because we just wanted to prove to them that we weren't British. <laughs> that they, they're the hooligans, we're the best. It's worth that we were innately peaceful or didn't drink when we went on the buddy with self police sense of whatever you do, don't you dare cause trouble. Well, we need a similar sense about Irish football supporters being Irish climate change supporters. Whatever you do, we're going to be good at this. And it's not as if it's a moral thing where you're watching over every single thing that they do. But no, we set up the systems so it makes it easy for us to do it without even bothering about it. So what you're saying, Eamon, is we need Jackie's army for climate change, right? <laughs> um, Claire, maybe you, if any, just listen to that range of questions um, coming from the UK context. Anything that strikes you or you want to respond to? Mm, um, there are lots of questions there. A couple of things stood out for me. I think it's this balancing sort of the lifestyle. You know, our day-to-day -day lives, we all face these decisions every day, you know, versus being, uh, living a climate-friendly lifestyle. Um, and I think those decisions are where, uh, I think it's tough, and, and I, because when I go back to sort of, when I was at the Alliance, you know, our whole theory was we we're gonna create a movement um, mobilize sort of everybody on this issue uh, through engagement and education and we had this theory of uh, like a ladder of engagement and action so you hook them you find ways to talk to them get them thinking and feeling and then you get them doing things or getting us to do things and the you know the first one was change your light bulbs turn the lights off 
um, you know, easy things, uh, recycle. The theory being that you, you, know, you start on the one step doing these quick and easy things, you know, behavioral change, then you, you, know, you get sort of brought into the whole thing, then you take the harder and the bigger decisions. You perhaps buy a, a Prius or you change your heating or you get solar panels and you know, on and on and on. The reality, I think, has panned out a bit different. And so I know a lot of uh, theorists are going back and looking at that. You know, was that counterproductive? Um, do you make those easy steps and then you sort of like get complacent and let yourself off the hook thinking, you know what, yeah, I care about climate change. I've changed my light bulbs. And then you carry on about your day-to-day -day business. Um, whereas, you know, and there's two different thoughts here, you know, like do we, um, a lot of the framing, a lot of ways we're talking to people about this is sort of... Um, Self-enhancement, I think, uh, people talk about. You know, if you do this, you know, it's going to be good for you too. You know, you're going to save money on your energy bills. If you're tackling climate change, that's great, but you're benefiting too, you know. And so you're, it's that sort of uh, individualistic, you know, um, way of engaging people. Well, in actual fact, that's not actually going to get it done. We're not going to solve this issue. We're not going to bring about this transformational change. <coughs> in our own day-to-day -day lives, as well as everybody's lives across the planet in that way. It is um, uh, it, it's sort of bigger than that. You know, it is self-transcendent, and it's that how, that's how we've got to talk to people, and that's how we haven't been yet, and we've got to find ways of doing it. So I think that's why this sort of, you know, engaging people sort of, you know, with culture and with the arts and sort of spiritually and thinking about our well-being and, you know, what does this mean? For, for me, my own thing, I mean, I used to think, um, you know, I'm always the one going around the house switching off the lights, turning down the thermometer, you know, turning off the taps and whatever else. And yet, you know, but I also thought an environmentalist, I never considered myself an environmentalist. I always thought an environmentalist, you know, those crazy people that chained themselves to the trees. No offence, Eamon. Um, <laughs> but uh, back at you for the, uh, for the football hooligan comment there. Um, <laughs> But I think, you know, it's changing labels, it's, um, you know, it, but it's hard. Like, we're going to have to make some really hard decisions. And, you know, you, again, you look in the mirror, you know, when you work in climate change, you're campaigning on it or communicating about it. You go home to your, to your own warm house and, you know, you drive your car, your kids to school, you eat your steak. And, you know, that's constantly at the back of your mind. So, um, but even those things are the small things that we have to do. Um, but I will say um, something about, you know, we know it's a long-term issue and it's a big, huge issue, co you know, very complex that we have to break down. Um, and it, this is the thing, you know, sort of about our values. We know where we want to get to, um, but there is the, you know, the real world we live in today. So I think that's where um, there's sort of very rich political debate and there is compromise and there is a role for pragmatism when you're talking about different technologies and different pathways. Um, uh, how we're going to get from where we are today to where we want to be in the future. Um, but I, I think that but that's what that excites me, how you engage the public about those choices, both from a very political, you know, sort of this climate change bill that's before you, but also on a very personal day-to-day uh, -day, uh, issue. But I would just say, finally, on the, on the arts, we've talked about, you know, books that are very meaningful, and there's obviously music, but also movies, and I have to sort of do, you know, you know, think back to movies that have moved us and changed our behaviours like Aaron Brockovich or An Inconvenient Truth, for example. I think all of these people that are working, you know, I think we have to take those, spread those messages. Um, uh, so again, I just end where I began, is just commending you, Eamon, to creating this space and uh, giving us time to think and feel this. Thank you. Ashin, do you want to... Answer, uh, I'll give it a go. I, I'm conscious that there's a, there's a lot of questions which we're not going to get no, that aren't going to get answered. Yeah. But but uh, that's when when we have a good dialogue or a good participation. That that's I guess a, a, something of a trade off. But um, I want to start by saying uh, I do think, as Eamon has said, that the the big picture in terms of where the campaigns are gone, where where 350.org is has gone, where Friends of International has gone, is to the extractive end of it, away from the tailpipe and into and towards keeping stuff in the ground. Uh, I think that is strategically correct and we maybe it may have been uh, wrong in the first place all those years ago. I also s do think it's much more tangible for people. It's much easier to, to relate to whether we mine for more coal or whether we, whether we frack uh, than it is to relate to the issues of, of parts per million uh, are, are, 
70 million tons for Ireland or how many tons per person or whatever it might be. So I think that's, that, is a, that is where the international um, climate justice campaigning is going. I think it's the right place to go. In the context of Ireland, and b based on what uh, Amy said about, about Cara's post on Pete, I, I think the other distinction to make is between, uh, and again this comes to the lifestyle question, the personal choices and the personal responsibility, whether we've, we've put it mostly on those, are the industrial scale. So I, don't, I didn't get a chance to read Cara's post yet, but I think the, the big decision Ireland faces on Pete is not whether we allow people to burn briquettes or even how many of the turf cutters cut turf if they're not on pristine bogs for now. It's does the ESB keep burning the stuff to make electricity? That's the big question we face over the next five years. We, we tackle that one. We stop the industrial burning of peat. And we'll go on to, so, so, you, so individuals see that those making the big decisions where there's big money at stake are taking the hit first, same as, the, as was the principle in international negotiations, and then it's fair to ask others to begin to amend their lifestyles. I also think, you know, there is, like, like with water in Ireland, there's this relationship with peat that we feel, therefore, it's ours, it's ours to burn. I think in, in easier, I don't think we need to challenge on the, on the industrial peat, is on coal. I don't think there's any great national attachment to the fact we burn coal in money point. So I think that that's also faces a big question in the next five years. Those are the real questions we face. That and fracking. So that's where I see those big, those big en um, extraction questions going. Uh, but on, on, just to briefly on, the, on the, that pers the personal responsibility part and lifestyle choices again. One of the stats I remember using quite a lot 10 years ago for a, for a few years was the, was the fact that, I don't, I don't even know how true it was, but uh, was that there was, 20, there was the equivalent of 26 power stations in the US uh, working full time, all the time, just to power devices that were on standby. Um, now, people kind of went, oh God, that's, that's amazing. And so that was part of a discussion about you know, the personal choices and we, we, we plugged the phone out. But there's two problems with that. One is, uh, and I think you've already alluded to it to some degree, is that there's, there's a disconnect between the size of the problem you've, you've just explained to people and the, and the actions you're asking them to take. So I've explained this civilization and threatening problem. Please plug out your phone before you go to bed. <laughs> um, and also, with the light bulbs, it's, it, you know, it's much easier to do what, to be fair, the, our, the last government here did, uh, which is ban the 100 watt light bulb, than it is to go door to door persuading individuals to change the light bulbs. You know, it is easier to regulate televisions, the manufacture of televisions, so the standby button goes off after 10 minutes, than it is to ask everyone to turn off the standby button. So there's some things that are just better done at a, at a, at a societal scale or a European scale. Um, so there, so, but, but, but there, uh, um, so, there's those, yeah, so I think that's, that it's fair, I, that's where we concentrate on asking people to get involved in the, in, in the, in the campaigning and the political action, as well as, or in, in, not necessarily instead of, but as a, as a, as a preference to, uh, to, um, to just unplugging your phone. Now that's not to address hardly any of the questions. Oh, one thing I did want to say about, about, the, about the, uh, people's reactions to things as well, it's fascinating to, to, to listen to someone like Brian Motherway from the SEAI talk about the psychology that they've now built up some expertise in the literature, but also in the practice of what, what people respond to. And you know, things like if you put a very complex smart grid, mini grid, like in the house, management system in the house, if you make the control panel too complicated, and you have these ones that are like iPads, people just walk up to it in the midst of a busy day and go, oh, and they press the manual override. You know, that, that you are, we have to make these, 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 these choices more simple. And if you look at what, how people, the, the response rates to the SEI grants, and in terms of applications, it doesn't respond to price at all. So all those things that I talk about, carbon taxes, mm -hmm. are that we talk about you know, uh, um, uh, you know, make, encouraging people to save money by, by investing. It responds to weather. When it's cold, the, the applications for insulation go up. When it's warm, people forget about it. So you, know, you, you need to actually do the research and see what people will actually respond to. And that's not to respond to half the questions. Actually, I would just say one thing about agriculture, if I may. <laughs> um, I spend a lot, one of the, you know, we've talked about media coverage, one of the things we do get media coverage of is that debate because it's people, the media prefers controversy and contested choices. So we'll get invited on to, uh, to debate the IFA on this or that. And actually one of the things I've, I've begun to realize, which we have, we've, we've been talking because of the Irish situation about production and whether we should be responsible for, our, for the emissions from our production of agriculture. So, but actually I think the, the, I'm hoping that the questioner might be wrong in that when we move, as we'll have to move to the diet question, there won't necessarily be the same challenge, it won't, it, won't, it won't come across as the same affront to Irish agriculture that some of the things we would say do, because they export 90% of it. So if we all decide to go, not necessarily vegetarian even, but you know, have a meat-free Monday instead of a Catholic meat-free Friday, it doesn't threaten the Irish agriculture industry, at least not, at least not practically, maybe in some symbolic way they'll, they'll, they'll find it unnerving. But their markets, as, the, as, as Minister Coveney would say, is, 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 is China and India, it's premium products and premium markets. So that's a, it's, a, it's a separate issue we have to deal with. But I think 
we won't, one thing we know is we won't all be in the world, won't all 9 billion, won't all be able to eat as much meat as we do in Ireland now, let alone what the US eats. So we'll, there'll have to be some dietary changes as well as production changes. Hey, Terry, we have, if you have anything to add in the last minute. Uh, I can, can you hear me? Excellent. Um, <laughs> oh dear, that would be tragic. Um, a couple of things. First of all, the question about the naysayers and how to cope in media terms with the naysayers. The answer is really, really simple. Be more interesting than them. It is that simple. You cannot afford to be virtuous and to spot every sentence with words like sustainable and holistic because they allow people to typify you, characterize you, and reject you. And being more interesting is the key thing. It does away with all naysayers. You should never try to convert a naysayer. Their entire identity is tied up in being a naysayer. Um, the second thing, I have to mention the thing about unleaded petrol, because I was there. I was advising the Minister for the Environment of the time, who shall be nameless, because I do not wish to be provocative. Um, and I was asked to come in one day and to have three advertising agencies uh, present, because at the time, you will remember this, Eamon, even if nobody else did, um, we were in trouble. We were about to be fined billions by Europe because of our inadequate take-up of unleaded petrol. So I sat through these three presentations and then I had to go into the minister's office with all of the officials there and give my verdict. And I said, all of the presentations were fantastic and I wouldn't use any one of the advertising campaigns. And there was a long silence and then one of the civil servants said, Miss Pro, would you care to suggest what we do instead? And I said, yeah, there's a budget coming up in eight weeks' time. Drop the price of unleaded petrol, 10 cent below the price of leaded petrol. It's just amazing how eager and persuaded people will get about unleaded petrol. It was the only time I ever suggested a policy thing to a government, and they did it, and look at where we are today. Um, I want to say two other things. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one is about um, the thing of being afraid to take the wrong action. I live in a mistake. It's called a Martello Tower. The British Admiralty decided that Napoleon was going to arrive by sea and therefore they had to have 78 of these very ugly squat towers built around the coasts of Britain and Ireland. Just to let you know, the ones on the south side of Dublin are built of cut granite. The ones on the north side, like the one I live in, are built of rubble, even back then. <laughs> <laughs> they possessed people's lands without permission. They dug quarries, they built these things in a period of five years. Each one cost an enormous amount of money and they were never of any use to anybody. I therefore live in a mistake. But I'm real enthusiastic about that mistake and I think if they could do something wrong with such enthusiasm, maybe if we got that sort of enthusiasm going for something right, it would be great. I am tired of conversation. I want leadership. I want passion, I want achievement, and above all, I want Ireland to lead the world in the technology, the science, and the passion for stopping climate change, or at least slowing it down to the extent that one tiny island can do it. Um. Thank you very much to all our panellists and thank you to everyone in the audience who contributed. I'm conscious we're very much over time and uh, Pierce, McLaughlin and the Nocturnes are going to give us another song. If you can um, hang about for that, it'd be worth your while. Um, 
I just want to say thank you to everyone who's contributed today. Thank you again to the uh, organizers, um, IBEC, ICTU, Christian Aid, TROCRA, and the Environmental Pillar. I want to alert you to our next um, event, which is next week, in fact. Uh, it's on the 26th of March uh, in the Stanley Quick Hall in the Trinity Biomedical Science Institute, which is on Pier Street, brand new building on, on Pier Street. Uh, the title of the session is A New Economy, and it includes a number of speakers who are going to address the question of what does a low-carbon future mean for the world of work, what does it mean for the world of business, what does it mean for how we uh, provide for ourselves into the future. And we've got some very interesting speakers from, we've got Sharon Burroughs coming over from the uh, International Trade Union Confederation, um, Sean O'Driscoll from Glen Diplex, amongst others, and George Lee from RTE will be doing my job, presumably much uh, more, oh, yeah, not half as well, yes, exactly. Uh, so that should be a very interesting session. I know it's only uh, just over a week away, uh, but uh, we'd love to see many of you there because I think this will work very well if we can keep this conversation going. Um, we're going to cover then in the third session, which is on the 8th of April, uh, the question of sustainable use of our land. So that takes in agriculture, land use, food, and we have a really interesting panel of speakers coming together for that. Um, a, a, a very packed program, which I think will be, will be really exciting. That's taking place in the Guinness Storehouse on the 8th of April. Um, we then move on to Christchurch Cathedral on the 20th of April. Uh, the music room in Christchurch, where we're having a session called Prophetic Voices. And really what that's about is picking up on some of the stuff we heard earlier about how people's values and faith can really um, move on this issue. And uh, Trocra and Christian Aid are taking the lead on, on curating that, that session. And then the whole series uh, finishes up on the 10th of May uh, in the Abbey Theatre. Uh, so that's a Sunday evening in the Abbey Theatre, where we're going to have music, drama, and we're going to have a harvest of everything that's been uh, discussed over, over these sessions. So it's been really inspiring to make a start here today. Uh, thank everybody who contributed, all our speakers, our artists and composers. Uh, I just want to say Chris is at the door there. He's going to take your cards so that you make sure that doesn't uh, just disappear. Uh, but if you wouldn't um, mind, I'll ask our panelists to leave the stage now and ask the band to come on to play us out. Thank you very much. Hi everybody, yeah. um, thanks so much Eamon for uh, inviting us along. I'm Pierce McLaughlin and we're Nocturnes. And I'm going to play a song from a project I uh, composed called Idiot Songs. And Idiot Songs is based on Fyodor Dostoevsky's The Idiot. And it centers around a character called Prince Mishkin, who's a very innocent and kind of naive character. And Prince Mishkin often kind of is presents people's problems to themselves because he's very perceptive, but because of this, he's kind of loathed. So I don't know how, that's kind of somewhat um, apt for tonight in some ways because I think what we've got to do is uh, keep on bringing the conversations to the table and keep on talking about um, this incredibly important issue. So this is called a wheel.
Thank <laughs> you. 